throughout the civilized world, particularly the Western world, diversity abounds. We see this diversity in our socioeconomic, cultural, and ethnic differences. But hidden beneath the surface, away from the eyes of the casual observer and the merely curious, is another society altogether. A society of secrets, to coin their own phrase. This is the largely invisible world of Freemasonry. I'm Mike Mandel. For the next little while, we'll be examining the beliefs, teachings, and practices of Freemasonry. We'll be speaking with former Masons and reviewing actual Masonic literature to try to gain an objective view of this hidden fraternal order. Our conclusions may prove to be quite startling. But in order to make this material coherent, it's essential to begin with an understanding of what Freemasonry is. Freemasonry defines itself as being a system of morality. The basis of Freemasonry, which all Masons go through, is the Blue Lodge. The Blue Lodge being the first three degrees or levels of Freemasonry. Entered Apprentice, the first degree, Fellow Craft, the second degree, and Master Mason, the third degree. Most Masons never go beyond third degree. Although if one chooses to go beyond the Blue Lodge, there are two routes that can be taken. One is the York Rite, and one is the Scottish Rite. Most Masons who decide to go past the Blue Lodge enter the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The Scottish Rite has 32 degrees. The 32nd can lead one into the Shriners if one so chooses. The 33rd degree, which does exist, is largely honorary. Author Ian Taylor has extensively researched the origins of modern Freemasonry. To many people, the very word Freemasonry evokes a sense of mystery, secret society, and so on. But in order to find out what they're all about, we need to know a little history. There were many humanist thinkers back in the 1500s who saw the corruption that there was in the church of the day, and they concluded that in order to get rid of that corruption, they would have to be a new world order. They had read Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic in the 1500s was now a popular work, and Plato too was a Greek philosopher living in the 5th century BC, and he too was totally fed up with the corruption that there was in government. He said, um, if we could have a group of wise men who were well paid to rule over the people, then there would be no corruption. It's a nice thought, but a rather naive one. We've seen such governments today, and they are totally corrupt. But nevertheless, there are still people today, many people, who think that it is a good idea. This then was the agenda for the humanist thinkers back in the 1500s. But in order to do that, they had to first destroy the existing world order, the existing world order based upon the rules of God through the king and through the church. But to even suggest this would have been seen to be heresy in its day, and they would have lost their heads quite literally. And so they had to go into a secret society. Now, the Freemasons in that day, these were craft masons. These were the men who actually built the cathedrals of the day. They were highly skilled men. Uh, and it was like an early trade union. And they wanted to keep the, the secrets of their skills to themselves. Good reasons for that. And so, um, the, the humanist thinkers infiltrated into the craft masonic lodges. And they then became the speculative masons. They were called speculative masons by the craft masons because they wouldn't have known a square from a compass. They were just the, the humanists, the, um, the idealists, the academics. And so there are within the masonic lodges today two types of mason. The craft mason, who is the genuine mason and cut stone and so on. And then there is the speculative mason, and he's the humanist thinker. He's the person whose um, purpose is to rebuild a new world order. Author and lecturer Ron Carlson has dedicated two years to researching the subject of Freemasonry. Well, modern masonry actually began in the year 1717 in England. Uh, the lodge was formed, and many of these things were developed after 1717 in England, and then came to America and Canada uh, as people migrated to North America during those years, and is widely established here in North America. It's estimated close to five million men are involved in Freemasonry here in North America, perhaps one million in the Shriners. What is Masonry in the eyes of the Freemason? What does the Mason view it to be? Well, you find that most Masons go into Masonry uh, viewing it simply as a fraternal organization, uh, kind of an advanced Boy Scouts because their father or grandfather was involved in Masonry. And they get into it uh, naively, not realizing that it is a religious organization designed for very specific spiritual purposes. Over the centuries, man has evolved a variety of religious beliefs and traditions. Some of these, such as Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are monotheistic. That is, they're based on the concept of one supreme deity. Others, such as Hinduism, are polytheistic, believing in many gods and goddesses. 
But one of the oldest religions is also the most universal, emerging virtually unchanged in geographically separated and radically diverse cultures. This is the religion of paganism, the worship of the moon goddess and the sun god, whether they're called Isis and Osiris, Apollo and Diana, Cernanos and Aradia, or a host of other names. Paganism is the same mystical religion that first emerged in ancient Babylon thousands of years ago. But what has paganism got to do with Freemasonry? The ritual and theology of Freemasonry really originates from um, Egyptian paganism. And the reason for this is that, as we find, in 1717, the rituals and theology were formalized and brought together and formed the Grand Lodge in England. Uh, the reason being that there were a great many lodges throughout England and throughout Europe at that time. They all had slightly different practices. These practices had originated from the origins of the speculative masons, which of course was Rosicrucianism. The Rosicrucians uh, believed in the Hermetic and Egyptian traditions, and as we'll find in, uh, within Freemasonry, we find Osiris, Adonis, and Isis mentioned quite frequently. So of course these are the Egyptian pagan symbols, pagan gods. One of the um, rituals that was used in some of the lodges prior to 1717, and shortly after, in fact, was the uh, ritual of the blood initiation rite. Uh, this was where the uh, little finger was cut and blood was shed, and this was the new member doing that, making a blood covenant with the organization. Uh, what happens is when a mason joins the lodge, he first enters into what is called the Blue Lodge. And the very first thing that every mason is required to do is to go through a initiation ceremony. It's called the Entered Apprentice Degree. And in that uh, initiation ceremony, uh, he will be stripped of much of his clothing, a blindfold will be placed over his eyes, a noose will be placed around his neck, and he will be brought to uh, the door of the Masonic uh, Lodge. And there uh, a person will greet him and usher him in, and there he will come before an altar. And every mason stands before an altar, and there <clears throat> behind the altar is a man called the Worshipful Master of the Lodge. Uh, today we find that when the new member joins the organization, he kneels, he's blindfolded, he's bare-breasted, and the Master of the Lodge touches his left breast with a sharply pointed sword. And they are then required, at, with this blindfold over their eyes, to take a blood oath, not to reveal the secrets of masonry, or they will uh, lose their life. Uh, every mason puts his thumb to his throat and he swears a blood oath not to reveal the secrets of masonry or to have his throat cut from ear to ear, his bowels ripped open and given to the beasts of the field. And these pagan blood oaths are taken uh, to swear them to secrecy so they will not reveal the secrets of what they will learn as they progress through the Masonic Lodge. Now most men will go into the Scottish Rite and progress on through 32 degrees and in each one of those degrees, they give worship to different gods and deities, Egyptian gods, Persian gods, Greek gods, and they go through a series of rituals. Now, much of this is covered up by symbols and allegories so that Masons, as they go through it, don't fully understand what they're doing. In the uh, blue degrees, an initiate is initiated into the Egyptian trinity of the ancient mysteries of Egypt. And this Egyptian trinity is hidden from the initiate. He does not know at all what he is being initiated into. It's not even mentioned. But if they would read their authoritative books which explain the symbols and the allegories, it becomes very obvious what they're involved in. They're involved in pagan, idolatrous worship, much of it based upon the Kabbalah, which is the ancient Jewish book of the occult. It is based on Egyptian paganism and the worship of nature. Is really what it is. It is, it is based on the worship of the uh, male regenerative power, the female regenerative power, okay, and their product. Any historian will readily agree that paganism is and was essentially a nature religion. Its rituals were intentionally designed around the phases of the moon, the seasons and the vernal equinox, etc. Rituals were developed to encourage abundant crops, usually by seeking the blessing of the sun, the giver of warmth, and the counterbalance of the moon, the timepiece for planting and harvesting. From this duality of worship, the sun and moon, light and darkness, active and passive, male and female, paganism developed fertility rites based upon the sex act, and more specifically, the reproductive organs themselves. This is one of the reasons why Masons, when they enter the lodge, are 
are uh, required to put on a white lambskin apron. Uh, Masons wear this white lambskin apron as a covering of what they ultimately believe is the Masonic uh, deity, what they call the generating principle of life. You know, they wear the square and compass, and in the center is a G. You see it on the Masonic lodges where they have the square and compass with the G. Uh, some Masons will tell you it means the geometric, uh, uh, the geometry of the universe, or it means God. Actually, in their own books say it's the generating principle of life, that uh, the compass or the square represents the female, and the compass coming down upon her represents the male that impregnates the female. And this generating principle, the male organ, is what brings immortality in life. You see, when they talk about immortality, uh, they are talking about uh, recreating life through uh, the sexual act. And this is what they are covering with the white lambskin apron. This is why a woman can never be a mason. She does not have the generating principle of life, which they proudly wear on their lapel as the square and compass and the G. Freemasonry uses Egyptian pagan symbols quite often, and we can see that. And one that comes to mind is the obelisk. The obelisk is a um, tall pillar in stone, tapered and square in section with a pyramidion on top. And that was used among the Egyptians as a resurrection symbol. And the idea was it was actually a phallic symbol. It stood tall and erect, and it was used to procreate and one was resurrected through one's offspring, and that was the argument. Well, the same thing applies today, and we find that where Freemasons are buried, for instance, very often it'll be an obelisk that's used as a grave marker. Uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, first Prime Minister of Canada, or um, George Washington, first President of the United States, their grave markers both contain uh, obelisks, and sometimes even the obelisk will even contain the um, compass and square to indicate quite clearly where they're coming from. But can this really be true? It seems incredible that Freemasonry, this system of morality, may actually be veiled paganism, and only lightly veiled at that. The point within a circle is one of the more prominent Masonic symbols. Past Grand Master Albert Mackey teaches in his Symbolism of Freemasonry, page 353, the point within a circle is derived from sun worship and is in reality of phallic origin. It is a symbol of the universe, the sun being represented by the point, while the circumference is the universe. Mackey states further in his Manual of the Lodge, page 56, the phallus was an imitation of the male generative organ. It was represented usually by a column, which was surmounted by a circle at its base. The point within a circle was intended by the ancients as a type of the prolific powers of nature, which they worshiped under the united form of the active or male principle and the passive or female principle. Paganism recognized and worshiped these powers as the creative force in nature. Albert Pike was grand commander of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in the 1800s. From his book, Morals and Dogma, the sun and moon represents the two grand principles of all generations, the active and passive, the male and female. Both shed their light upon their offspring the blazing star, or Horus. These Masonic authorities agree that the symbols of Freemasonry are occultic and derive from paganism. The alleged occultic rituals and symbolism that are central to Freemasonry were tremendously significant to me personally. I had been deeply involved in the many facets of the occult, including witchcraft for a number of years. Witchcraft is the religion of paganism. It's the worship of the sun god and the moon goddess in various forms. I was involved in the occult for about 12 years. Steve Warren was a practicing time, member of a coven a of witches. For me. That is, I was uh, constantly on a day-to-day -day basis reading, searching, uh, as well as practicing arts such as divination, um, getting in contact with the dead through mediums, uh, tarot cards, crystal balls, um, everything that we would consider a cult I was involved in. There's a great deal of symbolism in witchcraft itself. Uh, many of the, the implements used have significance uh, in terms of, of natural elements, such as the, the uh, wand representing air, the uh, thame, a sword representing fire, a chalice with water, or and a pentagram representing earth. 
and these were, would be combined in various manners in order to take advantage of the spiritual forces that were felt to be in operation at that particular time. And it was heavily ritualistic with the wearing of robes, uh, the drawing of magic circles, uh, the invoking of gods uh, to aid the practitioner, as well as um, just anything you would do, even if it was not in a formal ritual, always had something to do with ritual. Even if it was casting a spell, you would always light the candles, bring out the elements, uh, set up your altar. Some of the parallels between Freemasonry and witchcraft show such a similarity that it cannot possibly be coincidental. Similarities in ritual, wording, and symbolism are so close in several instances that it clearly suggests a common origin. To examine this possibility, I spoke with a number of former Masons and compared their Blue Lodge initiations with the experiences of former occultists. In the initiation in Freemasonry, we had to be recommended by another Mason. Well, in order to join witchcraft, you have to be first screened you have to be recommended by somebody currently in witchcraft. Well, when I was initiated, I was blindfolded and bound by a rope. And on your bare chest was thrust the point of a spear. In witchcraft, we were initiated through a, uh, a very involved ritual, uh, initiation ceremony, uh, wherein the uh, candidate was led uh, blindfolded, uh, bound by a rope, uh, to the edge of uh, the uh, magic circle. And the rope is around your neck and your lid forward. And up front, in the eastern end of the building, is a person who's a worshipful master. And you kneel down before him as if he were a god. You were met uh, by the uh, high priest or high priestess uh, at that time, usually with a sword uh, to your chest. When I went to enter the lodge, a sharp object was put to my left breast. And I was warned that should I reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry uh, to know what to expect. When you're presented before the high priest, a sword is held against your chest and you actually take a blood oath promising to remain faithful to the secrets of witchcraft. Well, when you are in the room, this um, blindfold is taken away from you. And this is a time when they say that you're coming from darkness into light. During the initiation ceremony, the, the initiate is led by the lieutenant of the uh, high priest and is challenged at the edge of the circle by someone saying, who goes there? And the answer is, one from the world of darkness. In masonry, the prayers are ended with, so mote it be. Oh, and one of the other aspects of, uh, or distinctives of the craft was that we would always end any spell or ritual where we released the power, this is where the power was released with the word so mote it be. I was intrigued to discover that witchcraft and Freemasonry had so much in common. However, in white witchcraft, followers dismiss the biblical concept of Lucifer. Freemasonry goes so far as to actually call Lucifer God. In the words of sovereign pontiff of universal Freemasonry, Albert Pike, yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai, the Hebrew god of the Bible, is also God. And the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, god of light and god of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil. Listen to the words of 33rd degree Mason Manley P. Hall. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply this energy. Of the literally millions of Masons worldwide, how many of them are actually aware of the true meaning of the Masonic symbols? The answer is very few. Since most Masons never go past the third degree of the Blue Lodge, the, the rank of Master Mason, the vast majority of them never discover what they're involved in. And they never will discover what Freemasonry is all about unless they venture into the higher levels of the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. In fact, they're not just ignorant, they're deliberately misled by their superiors in the Lodge. In the words of Masonry's own authority, Albert Pike, 
The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine that he understands them. And many Masons go through the first three degrees, become a master Mason, and they just quit there, thinking that this is just a nice fraternal organization. And they do not realize that their own leaders have consciously lied and deceived to them because they do not want them to know the true teachings of masonry. I went in there um, with all good intentions, um, thinking I was uh, entering to, you know, into a, a fraternity that, that was really interested in, in helping people. But uh, now I, I realize that in the lower echelons, in the lower degrees, uh, you don't realize what what's happening. Well, the meaning of the Lodge and um, what it was about to me was a group of people who were out to help other people. And there were different things that you could see in the Lodge. The people were close together. They were bound by something. And I thought it was a Christian organization. What made uh, one think that the uh, Lodge was um a Christian place was the fact that I found people who were uh, members of the same church uh, to uh, which I belong, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, were members of the Lodge, uh, members in prominent positions in the Lodge. And the fact that these members uh, in their rituals used uh, quotations from scripture uh, sort of doubly made one think that it was okay. They think that they are actually being initiated into a Christian organization. And it's because the three degrees in, in the Blue Lodge are veiled in a, in a veneer of Christianity. Jesus Christ is central to the Christian faith. In fact, without him, there is no Christianity. That is because Christ claimed to be God incarnate. And as such, Christ cannot be separated from his teachings. He did not teach a system of morality to lead one to God. Instead, he claimed to be the way to the Father. But what is the official Masonic teaching about Jesus Christ? Listen again to Supreme Pontiff of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, Albert Pike. It, Masonry, reverences all the great reformers. It sees in Moses, the lawgiver of the Jews, in Confucius and Zoroaster, in Jesus of Nazareth, and in the Arabian iconoclast, great teachers of morality and eminent reformers, if no more. In other words, Jesus Christ is reduced to being a great reformer, no different than Confucius or Zoroaster. But the Bible says plainly in Acts chapter 4, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The very essence of Christianity is man's inability to save himself. For this cause, God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross and make atonement for us. How different this is from the teaching of Manley Hall in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. The true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the light bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, pagoda, cathedral, and realizes with his true understanding the oneness of all spiritual truths. No true mason can be narrow, for his lodge is the divine expression of all broadness. No true mason can be narrow, for his lodge is the divine expression of all broadness. An interesting statement, since in the Bible Jesus Christ says, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. When Masons say that Jesus Christ is simply another great moral teacher, another great moral prophet, uh, equal with Buddha, in fact, Masons teach, according to Albert Pike, that Buddha was the first great Masonic teacher. So they're equating Jesus with Buddha, with Muhammad, with the religious leaders, as just another religious leader. He is not God. He is not the incarnate Savior who came to save men from their sins. 
because Masons do not need a savior. Masons feel they can save themselves through moral good deeds. In the lodge that I belong to, we had a Muslim apply for membership. And the membership of our lodge didn't know how to initiate him because we knew we couldn't initiate him on the Holy Bible. So uh, we wrote a letter to the Grand Lodge of Alberta asking him for instruction. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, a letter came back stating that we should place the Koran and the square and compass beside the Bible and the square and compass on the altar and initiate him with full honors. Bible-believing Christians accept the fact that God exists in a trinity of three persons, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what most people, including many Masons, don't realize is that the God of Freemasons, the great architect of the universe, is also a trinity. In both the Scottish and York Rite, you discover that Masons are on a journey seeking to find the lost name of God. Part of their religion, they say, is that uh, the sacred name of God has been lost. And they tell this whole story of the building of Solomon's temple and the architect, Hiram of Biff, uh, who in building the temple lost the sacred name of God. And so they say that Masons are on this search to recover the, the lost name of God. And finally, when you get to the Royal Arch degree, the Mason is finally told what the secret name of God is that only Masons can know. And they pride themselves that they alone are the custodians of the secret name of God. And that name can only be whispered among Masons by three Masons, each saying a syllable. The name is Jobulon. It is a combination of three words, Jehovah, Baal, and Osiris, the Egyptian sun god. Yah, Bel, On. Yah, Bel, On. Yah, And what a Mason is worshiping in the Masonic Lodge is a three-headed god made up of Jehovah, Baal, which was the fertility god of Baal back in Lebanon, and Osiris, the Egyptian sun god, represented by the phallic symbol, uh, uh, the sexual uh, worship in Egypt. And they have combined this into a three-headed monster and say that is the Masonic God they worship. Salvation to the Christian is based entirely upon the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible teaches that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It teaches that no matter how hard we work to be good, we can never attain to the standards of the sinless Almighty. But God gives the free gift of eternal life to those who believe in Jesus Christ and allow him to pay for their sins on his cross. In the words of John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation to the Mason is something entirely different. Masons are counting on their own good works, something that the Bible says cannot possibly save them. In fact, the Masonic monitor teaches that God, the all-seeing eye, will reward men according to their works. The all-seeing eye pervades the inmost recesses of the human heart and will reward us according to our merits. In the 19th degree of the Scottish Rite, the Mason is told, Masons who have given proof of their attachment to the statutes and rules of the order, which in the end will make them deserving of entering the celestial Jerusalem or heaven. The 28th degree of the Scottish Rite states, The true Mason raises himself by degrees till he reaches heaven. Masons believe that they can earn their salvation and they, they can climb a ladder up to God. They call the great architect of the universe. And that one day they'll stand before God and God will usher them into heaven, not because of Jesus Christ, but because they were a good Mason and they did all of these good works. In fact, I was speaking to the head potentate of the shrine in Minneapolis, where I'm from. He called me up one day. And he had heard my tape on masonry. He says, how dare you say that masonry is not Christian? He says, I'm a deacon in my church. I teach Sunday school in my church. He says, I'm a good Christian. He says, and I'm the head of the shrine. How can you say I'm not a Christian? And I stopped and I asked him one question. I said, well, sir, I said, if you were to die and stand before God tonight, and he should ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? I said, what would you say to him? And I'll never forget there was a silence for about 10, 15 seconds. And, and then he said to me, he said, well, 
I guess I would tell him I was a good Mason. If Masons are depending upon the Lodge to save them, then their trust is as misplaced as those who depend upon church membership rather than on Christ. One might just as well depend on belonging to the Kiwanis or Rotary Club if good works would save us. I was speaking down in, in Texas, in South Texas, where uh, in a large church, uh, the Masons uh, who were in the church, uh, many of them on the altar board, uh, saw my tape Sunday morning when I was speaking there, and they said, you know, why are we allowing this man into our church? Uh, uh, he's criticizing Freemasonry. And most of the elder board were Masons. The Sunday school teachers were Masons. In fact, one of the elders was the worshipful master of the lodge in town. Another one was the supreme potentate of the shrine. And they came to me after the service, and I said, well, you have the books. I said, look up in your own books, in context, what I say. I gave the chapters of the page numbers. They spent till 4 in the morning, Sunday night, going through all the documentation in their own Masonic library. They came back Monday and they said, we want you to know, Ron, we all resigned from the lodge last night. And we are seeing this happen all across the country as Masons will peel away the outer wrapping of the package and examine the content of what they're in. They will discover that they are in a non-Christian, pagan, idolatrous cult and no Christian has any part in it. In this video, we've tried to be objective. We have no axe to grind, either with organized Freemasonry or with individual Masons. There's absolutely no doubt that a great deal of good has been done in the name of Freemasonry. And the morals of many, if not most Masons, are of a very high order indeed. But that is unfortunately not the issue here. The real issue is that Masonry is a pagan religion that has more in common with witchcraft than Christianity. This is a time when they say that you're coming from darkness into light. Its God is not the God of the Bible. Its God is Jobulon, a composite of Jehovah, Baal, the Canaanite fertility deity, and On, or Osiris, the Egyptian sun god of phallic worship. Its means of salvation is not the cross of Christ, but a system of morality and good works to endeavor to attain to the celestial lodge. And to the Mason, Jesus Christ is not the sinless son of God, but is degraded to the position of being just a great reformer, no different than Buddha, Confucius, or Muhammad. It is here where we take issue with Freemasonry. The same Jesus who claimed to be God in human flesh also claimed to be the only way to the Father. He also said that a man cannot serve two masters. If you are a Mason, you must make a decision. You cannot be a Christian and remain in the Masonic Lodge. Either let your sins be nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or try to pay for them yourself in the system of morality and good works. There are verses in the Bible that state that we should come out from among them. That we should, that darkness has no relationship with light. And also in the book of Proverbs it states that there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. And so therefore, my uh, advice is to walk away from it. 